So good morning, everyone. We're almost good afternoon. So welcome to um, this portion of our of our program this morning. And um, this is really about public health. And we're going to tie in some conversation around public health in some ways that might seem a little bit unique. Um, we have a distinguished panel with us. And what I'm going to do, instead of me introducing them, I'm going to have them introduce themselves. And they're going to start out with um, kind of a presentation, uh, sharing us some perspective from where they come from. We have with us uh, for the Lorraine County Board of Health, uh, Mr. Mark Adams, uh, Dr. Stark from Cleveland Clinic, the Avon uh, campus, uh, Executive Director. We have Executive Director Janine Donaldson from Elyria YWCA, and the she'll talk about it. It's a new organization. Um, it's very going to be dynamic in a part of this presentation. I think you'll find that interesting. We have Lieutenant Welsh from the Elyria Police Department, and then again from the Health District, uh, Jasmine and Marcus, who is actually a former councilman, Marcus Madison and now works for the Cleveland Clinic, and um, they have some information I think you will find interesting. Uh, they're going to present a little bit, I'm going to ask them a few questions, and they're going to entertain some questions from you all. And again, um, Mark, that is your Seth, first. Seth, well, I'm seeing. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, I came here, became the health commissioner last January, 22, and, um, uh, but where I came from the path is kind of how I do the thing that I do when it comes to public health. So I, I usually tell a story. I got to tell a story. Usually, people that know me for a long time are like, "Oh, not another story." But I kind of have to. Any veterans in here? Okay, there's a thing that I'm going to say that you're going to automatically get as soon as I say it. Now. But uh, so this right here is 36 years old. Uh, this is a binder that was given to me uh, when I first joined the service. A month after I joined, my brother was killed in a car accident. And the military came to me and they said, we're going to let you out. We're going to go ahead and let you out. We're not going to make you go. and We're not going to make you serve or anything. We're going to go ahead and let you sign up and uh, leave the service. And um, Willie T. Harris was a Vietnam vet. Uh, he, was a, he was a drill sergeant that was any other drill sergeant. Uh, but Willie Harris uh, came to me and he brought this to me. And he goes, don't ever let anything negative define your life. Take this. And it had a little scroll pad in it as well. And he said, write a different story. Make it better. And so from that point on, I, I tried to make it as best as I could. Uh, one thing that was evident, though, was that even though I was in a service and I learned right away, I mean, I grew up in Canal Fulton, Ohio, so I can imagine that Canal Fulton is probably, oh, I mean, Canal Fulton is not any type of, uh, it's, it's the suburban suburbs. And when I got there, uh, you know, I had a culture shock when I got in there. But I learned one thing right away as a 17-year-old, is that we all cried exactly the same the very first night. It didn't matter where you came from. It didn't matter what city you were from. We, back then in the 80s, you could actually, instead of going to jail, you could be, a, you could be uh, enlisted in the service as your, as, your, um, uh, as your service if you were convicted of a crime. Uh, so it didn't matter where we came from. I just remember everybody uh, all, at night when the lights went out. Was <laughs> why am I doing this? <laughs> um, but but what was clear is that while maybe I saw that we all were all the same, the way that everybody was treated was not the same. And my entire career has listened has been about Willie Ayers and all those other voices that have talked to me about how do I do? How do I make change? How do you make it positive? How do you take a negative? positive. 
and make it better for everybody. And so the, my entire career has been that. The career has been that way. And when I go to in Canton, uh, the same thing. When uh, I was in Canton for 24 years, and when it came to doing our job, we did our job was I wanted to be the department, the government. Remember, you hear that, that thing that government is here to help, and it's always kind of a joke. And I want, but I didn't like that. Um, I wanted to be that form of government that when we showed up in a vehicle, that it didn't matter where you were from, where you came from, that we all had the same problem, the same plight. And whether it was a public health issue, it was to solve that public health issue. And to be one of the trusted departments. And we were. Whenever we pulled up, and it took years, it took five years, five straight years of working hard at it. But whenever we pulled up in trucks, it didn't matter where you came from, who you were, you came outside. This is the department I can trust and I can talk to. And people did. They came out and they talked to us. And I get here, when I got here, uh, we were in the midst of COVID. And the former health commissioner brought me on uh, because I had done mass vaccination clinics for years. And uh, he said we, we had known each other for a long time. And he said, hey, I'm retiring, but I need somebody to run these vaccination clinics. So I looked at their plan, and their plan said, we're going to go to five to seven locations and try to vaccinate 150,000 people. And I said, no, we're not going to five or seven locations. We ended up at over 140 separate locations. We took vaccine to porches, to churches, to backyards. It didn't matter where. Because one of the things that, you know, transportation is an issue, trust is an issue. Uh, there are so many aspects that I'm not even going to pretend to know from that are issues that create a barrier between public health and the public health system and making things better. So the goal was to get out there and take the vaccine. We never dropped out of the top 10 when it came to vaccinated status, uh, both not only in number of citizens, but when it came to citizens that did not have the same access to health care as everybody else. So that, uh, that led us into 2022. And we came up with, uh, we have to do health departments and hospitals have to do a community health assessment for the hospitals community health needs assessment. When our community health assessment came out in mid-July, I looked at it, and one of the things that um, uh, when I was mentioning Willie Ayers, I wanted to say it was his voice um, that when he was uh, telling me, you know, hey, these are, this is the way you should direct your life, I saw in the community health assessment another voice, and when I looked at the data, every bit of the data showed in every single category, chronic disease, infant mortality, in every aspect, African American men and women suffer more greatly than any other race. And infant mortality, it was at almost three times as high where black babies were dying than any other, any other race. That is to me another voice that says, hey, you got to do something different. It's got to, you've got, there's something else you have to do to fix this. And I've told the staff, there is no way at the end of three years, because that cycle is every three years, that I'm going to be able to look at the community and say, well, I tried. Now, it, it just can't. There's no way I can look at you and say that it was OK that we still have the numbers the way that we have. This is something that's been going on a long time. Um, I looked at old uh, reports, old annual reports from the health department from 20 years ago, from 25 years ago, from 30 years ago. The information was still written in those reports when it came to infant mortality, when it came to chronic disease and race. So, I'm just telling you, there's no way, and I've got more specific information from Jasmine of uh, what we're going to do, but just in the commitment, it's your voice, that the cha is the voice that tells me what to do, Willie T. Harris, that voice, and many others. And I still learn even to this day, is that I got this book from Janine Donaldson a couple months ago, and um, uh, for essential black wisdom and, and black voices, and um, I, I'm, I'm hearing it. Uh, but I, I read that just because I, I don't I don't claim to know every perspective. There's no way I can. I know where I grew up. The only thing I can do is listen to your voices to tell me what it is that you need. How can I bridge that gap? Because I really need to I need to stop that infant mortality piece as much as I can. And so I need those voices to help me guide to do that. So some of the things that we're doing uh, that we started right away once we found this out. Uh, that's why we have uh, Jasmine here to kind of give you an idea of what we started in 22. So, hi everyone. There's Jasmine. Jasmine, <laughs> Jasmine Montanez. Um, so I, I've been with the health department since August, and, and there have been some uh, huge leaps and bounds that, that's been happening um, even before I started there. So one of the things that we're doing 
at the health department, hearing everyone's voices, um, is that we're implementing a CHW program. Those are community health workers. These are our boots on the ground. These are our people who are going to continue to go to those porches, continuing to provide that transportation and bridging that gap between um, the needs of our community and those resources. Um, we are meeting with uh, community leaders. We are really trying to sit down and listen to and, and, and hear what the community wants us to do versus us being the health department and we just go in and say, this is what we think you should do. Um, it should be a collaborative effort, especially historically with the black community, it hasn't been a collaborative one. So that's one thing that, that we are going to change with the Lorraine County Health Department. Um, there's 231GO, there's resource mothers, there's all these different um, uh, supports that we would like to implement with the, with the permission and the blessing of the community. Um, so you guys will see a lot from myself, from my colleagues, from Mr. Adams, um, because as I was saying, this is a collaborative um, effort that we want to, to bridge this gap between the health department, uh, health in general, and specifically the black community. So, you see this thing. <laughs> it will be around the last. <laughs> Thank you. And Dr. Starks, if you could share sure. your perspective from your Sure, sure. I'd be happy to share my perspective. And I didn't prepare anything specifically to say, but I think all of us, our experiences in life are what leads to our perspective. So I'm an OBGYN physician and have been practicing in Northeast Ohio since 1999. Uh, focused largely in Cuyahoga County um, and began in a leadership journey around 2010 and led a group physicians at Cleveland Clinic and one of the issues that became very forefront to me was infant mortality. The state of Ohio, the United States is one of the worst in the entire world in infant mortality and uh, the state of Ohio is about at number 48 so we are one of the worst performing states especially when we look at uh, the disparities between black infants and white infants. Um, and Commissioner Adams mentioned a little bit about that. Um, we see huge variations uh, depending on where you live, depending on your race and other factors. Um, and so I, I took on, um, there was a, an organization called First Year Cleveland that was formed with the three large health agencies to address specifically Cleveland. Cleveland and Cuyahoga County, again, within the state, are worse and actually much worse than Lorraine County. I'm happy to say Lorraine County has done very well over the course of 10 years, but not where we need to be still when we look at the disparities. And when we look at the overall rates, it's about eight babies per thousand. It's a rate of about eight babies per thousand. That's overall rate. But when you look at black infant mortality versus white baby, it's a much broader disparity. It's about a four to one ratio in Cuyahoga County. Lorraine undertook a mission um, really beginning around 2007 until 2017, when we looked at that 10-year range, the infant mortality rate at the beginning stages were about 19 per thousand babies for black babies in Lorraine. Mercy Moms, actually out of Mercy Health, was what you're talking about, community health workers that were hired by Mercy, the Sisters of Mercy, and they said, we really need to address this. And they, it's really about how do we get people access to what they need, not just health care, 80% um, of health outcomes are attributed to those, what we call social determinants of health. <clears throat> Food insecurity, transportation, safe housing, education, jobs, those are the things that really impact how health outcomes are implemented. And I think that was very impactful. And when I took on my role as president of Cleveland Clinic Avon Hospital, it was 2014, 2015, I immediately got involved with the county health department and now the other agencies addressing our community health needs. And of course, infant mortality was one of those. We were starting to see those rates come down due to the great work of the community health workers. But again, recognizing that we still aren't where we want to be from the disparity standpoint. Lorraine County does do better than Cuyahoga County, but we're still not there. And we see the rates still um, sometimes even higher than what we want on a year to year basis. Um, another initiative that I really um, started to lead that I think is criti of critical importance 
is addressing substance use disorders and the st stigma around substance use disorders. Um, as a health care provider, um, practicing for since um, 1997, after my residency, I look back at the years when no one talked about the <coughs> risk of addiction for the medications that we were prescribing. And when I talk to patients now who suffer from substance use disorders, it's very clear to me that we were a big part of the problem. We used to write lots, lots, and lots of narcotics to our patients because we felt that we needed to address their pain. We truly didn't recognize the risk that that put our patients in. Um, I also recognize that people will self-medicate when they've lived through traumatic events. When they've had pain, pain can be psychological or it can be physical. And the risks of not talking to young children about how do we address pain, how do we how do we have resilience so that we can come back from a difficult situation and not medicate? Um, but I have true empathy for people who suffer from substance use disorders because it's got to be hell. And I think that um, it's another area that, especially with regards to pregnant women, we have a, a time where they really want to do well for that baby. And I truly believe they're more motivated during pregnancy than any, any other time. Um, so, having led in that area, I'm very proud of what we've been able to build around a care path to help manage women with substance use disorders and help them to get into an area where they're treated appropriately so they can manage out of that. But it, it requires ongoing care and concern. Um, as I've pivoted to the hospital where we don't deliver babies, I've had to really change my practice and change my thoughts around what does it mean to have um, a healthy community? Like I said, it's, it's far more than the care that we deliver in our hospitals and our buildings. We have to figure out how to care for people outside of those buildings. We can only care for the people who come to see us when they come to see us. It's, it's a very different thing when you look at public health. And as Commissioner Adams said, I mean, getting the vaccines to doorsteps, to churches, to the YMCA, wherever it is, similarly with health care, we can only be as healthy as people who are at least healthy in our community. And so when we surround everyone around us with what they need to have health and wellness, it's far more than health care and delivery of health care. Again, it's food, it's nutrition, it's a social environment where you know that people care about you, um, it's education, it's jobs. And so all of that is what I think this community can look forward to going forward and I continue to commit myself and our work along with the other healthcare agencies in the county health department, but we need a, we need everyone to focus on what it means to be healthy. So that's my story. I have a question. Sure. When you refer to uh, infant you mortality, to what, what are you referring to age-wise as an infant? So anytime there's a heartbeat, and so there's a lot of discussion. Babies are not considered viable until roughly 23 weeks of gestational age. Well, but we do look at the infant mortality definition is a, a baby that's born with a heartbeat and dies within the first year of life. So, in fact, the number one reason is preterm birth. And many of those babies are born where they're not viable or they're extremely premature. And so there are factors that we could address. Certainly to me, the most tragic is a baby that dies from a sleep-related death, uh, perhaps sleeping in the bed with their parents if they don't have a, a crib to sleep in. That's truly very tragic and horrifying for the family members. But <coughs> premature birth is actually the, the number one cause, uh, typically on any given year. So if we can address women who are at risk with, for premature birth, we hopefully can have more impact on those outcomes. Thank you. Next, we have Mrs. Janine Donaldson from the Larry White WCA. In the... Sorry. Well, I'm, I'm losing the. I wasn't uh, sure if this was. Oh, I'm sorry, Marcus. Do you? Yeah. I have one more slide. Focus on the social determinants of health. Do you want us to cover that yes. now, and then we can switch over? All right. So we just have one more slide to talk about what is social determinants of health. Oftentimes, we speak in acronyms. I'm, I'm learning, you know, being six months new to the clinic, there's a lot of acronyms. So how can we take some of these very, very complex issues and simplify it? So we just wanted to take a moment, 
maybe Mr. Adams or, or Dr. Stark to talk about some of these social determinants of health and why it is important that we do focus on them. And, and I want to applaud many of you in the audience because, you know, long before we've had names and titles and definitions around some of these things, a lot of folks have been working hard to move the needle forward along the issues of how do we build a, a community? How do we talk to one another? How do we take care of, you know, Aunt B that lives at the end of the corner who's already dealing with X, Y, and Z as a community? And so now we're talking about social determinant of health, but really it's everyday quality of life issues and how can we as individuals take ownership and a stake in building community? So if you could maybe just talk a little bit about that. Uh, normally in a community health assessment, there is no cause to say these are why things exist. That's one of the things that we did. We, we actually added what the cause was. So what the social determinants help, it's simply those factors that exist in our neighborhoods that have a direct relationship between our health and between what it is that we need. So imagine if you have this perfect, this perfect neighborhood. You've got a hospital in the middle. You've got a grocery store in the middle. You've got perfect transportation. It drives you back and forth wherever you need. If you don't have transportation, you've got it. Imagine the school is right in the middle. You have easy access to it. The buses run regardless of the levy. Doesn't matter. Everybody gets to school. In that perfect society, those things exist. The perfect medical care, the education access, jobs. Everybody's got a job. The job is all around. There's plenty of business to be able to provide a job. And when it comes to social and community context, meaning that we have the ability, we're talking to each other. We have a neighborhood, an actual neighborhood. And those social determinants of health, when those start to get eroded, then complications exist. So let's take uh, when it comes to uh, neighborhood and built environment, all right? So one of the things when I bring up Canton uh, is that when it came, came to cleaning up neighborhoods, what happens, what happens, anybody has ever seen in a centric area in the side of city limits, what ends up happening with that? Industry starts there, right? We build a city around industry. And then what happens? Flight from them, going out into the suburbs, transportation becomes more accessible. Who moves out of the suburbs? Those that can afford transportation in the suburbs. All right, so what happens to your inner cities? Industry still sits right around where most often African-American population is. So you're next to the industry. And then you'll start seeing maybe the schools will head out that way as well. Uh, we'll head out to the neighborhood. Then you'll see when, when, uh, when it comes to social community and context, neighborhoods become then start to become eroded then because people start to move away, move out. So in each of those aspects, as those things continue to erode, the access to health care and then uh, the needs that you have continue to erode as well. And then, so transportation doesn't exist like, you know, I'm not on the bus route to get to the health department. So, I mean, that's something that we're going to work on, but the health department is not directly on the bus route. And I think they will drive you in if you tell them I need to get a shot at the health department. But that's, that's a perfect example of, you know, back when the centric and the concentric area started, so your city and then you were just outlying city, started it started around these hubs transportation that allowed movement out and then erosion from within and so cities go through these cycles well the problem is we're in a cycle to where these things are now directly related when it comes to the health and disparities and race in each of those health ones liver disease cancer uh, each of those infant mortality disease, diabetes and all of those things that, so red uh, food uh, you ever heard the word food desert if you, had, if you hadn't heard of food desert, where it comes to, there's just no access to food. In Canton, we came from, uh, there was an area in Northeast Town, the only place to get food was either at a McDonald's or at a gas station within two miles of a city. So what do you think is happening to the health of the people that live around that area? Diabetes, heart disease, well, everything goes up and it increases. So that's what the social determinants are, basically looking at the neighborhood. Not, not just the city, but each individual neighborhood, seeing what's around it and what's eroding away from it, and then how do we fix that piece? So the uh, panelists up here, most often we're looking at the healthcare piece. We're also responsible for the neighborhood and build environment. So when Jasmine was letting you know kind of what we're doing in 22 in the health department, one of the other things that's happening is we've divided the environmental health section up because I'm going to bring what we had in Canton to here, in Tulare, and in Lorraine, and in Oberlin where there's a direct relationship between the health department and the built environment, the community that's out there when it comes to housing, when it comes to other type of code enforcement, assisting the city and things that we used to do 
I've talked with the three mayors on that, assisting them on the programs that we have. How do we make, there's no reason that just because you're in a city, that the, that the housing stock has to keep going down and keep going down. And we were effectively able to do that. We saw in, in Canton, I was, I was pretty proud when I left there, been gone for a number of years, and there was somebody that goes around and takes video of YouTube or neighborhoods on YouTube. And he went through East Cleveland, he went through Steubenville, went through these towns. And I, then I saw there was one that was being posted for Camp Ohio. And he started driving down thinking, oh no, please tell me, I know it's only been seven years, tell me. Mm -hmm. And as he was driving through, one thing that did not exist in his video, garbage, trash, shutters hanging down from there, high weeds and grass, none of that existed. They still had vacant homes, but the things that we had set in place we're still sticking to it even after being on seven years. That those, and I talked to former, my former staff, were like, we're still doing those things and working together. So it's completely doable. Every bit of it's completely doable. And it doesn't take a billion dollars to do it. It took no extra money for us to do that. That, all of this does not mean it takes more money to do it. But it takes you letting us know, sharing that information, and being, like I said, being the voice to tell us what it is that you need. But you'll end up starting to see us before the end of 23, a lot more. So that's that's more, a little bit more on social determinants at all. Thank you. 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 Mark, thank you for that meeting. <laughs> um, actually, both Dr. Stark and Mark have been talking about social determinants of health, the impact of health on communities of color. And we're going to specifically talk about the uh, African American community. And when I talk to the community in general, I like to say that this is in no disrespect to uh, the other people of color, Hispanics, and the actual folks that we work with Hispanics, Asian people, indigenous people. But the genesis of race and race relations in the United States started with Africans, so hence African Americans. So whether you go back to 1619 with Africans, being here as slaves, or 1776, it has been consistent that this has been a problem. So, I'm the executive director of the Olivia YWCA, and uh, we stand in the gap. Tim had mentioned that, and actually Tim is a former employee, I'm so proud of Tim. <laughs> Tim had mentioned that the YWCA had come up with a new program. It is not a new program. We are rebranding ourselves. The YWCA mission, and this is the mission of YWCAs throughout the country. If you're in Seattle, Washington, if you're in San Antonio, Texas, the mission is the empowerment, the elimination of, the elimination of racism, and the empowerment of women. And I want to point out something to you. Again, the mission is the elimination of racism and the empowerment of women. And for a women's 